I've got some ideas brewing and one is a resource for uh, believers to be able to study kind of over do, do overviews of the fundamental concepts in the Christian life from a grace perspective uh, but with real solid material with some Bible verses that you can actually look up and get into uh, and so I thought I'd give this a try. This is based on a, this is a book that I did. I didn't write it. it I, I went through <laughs> as a younger believer um, called Major Bible Themes by Lewis Berry Schaefer, and I strongly recommend it. It's got all these different chapters, and each chapter is short but super dense. And it's, uh, it's all the major, a lot of the major topics you really need to know um, and how to differentiate the right from the wrong ideas um, with lots of verses this is very valuable so I'm gonna try it here I'm gonna go through a chapter on the substitutionary death of Christ uh, and see how I do I actually tried to do this on my computer upstairs and recorded for 40 minutes and realized I hadn't recorded so I'm like okay I need to change the scene I'm gonna try this again <laughs> um, hopefully it's not gonna be dry uh, I'm thinking about having a few people do this with me and putting together a playlist. All right, so here we go. Um, the substitutionary death of Christ, God of God the Son. Whether in Bible doctrine or in common speech, the word substitution means the replacement of one person or thing for another. Okay, we know that. You're substituting one thing for another. Though it's not a biblical word per se, its specific meaning when related to the scriptures is concerning the work of Christ on the cross, and it is indicated, or by it is indicated the fact that those unmeasured righteous judgments of God against the sinner, because of his sin, were borne by Christ, substituting in the sinner's place or room instead. The result of this substitution is itself as simple and definite as the transaction. The Savior has already borne the divine judgments against the sinner okay, um, to the full satisfaction of God. There is therefore nothing left for the sinner to do or for him to persuade God to do. But he's asked to just believe this good news relating it to his own sin and thereby claim his personal savior so we have jesus christ the son of god who substituted his self in the place uh, to bear the judgments that were due to our sins and he's already done this so there's nothing left to do okay there's no uh, there's nothing you can do to persuade God to forgive you, like repenting or crying or making vows or trying harder. All of that is ruled out because what God has accepted is Christ. And he substituted him in your place, and the payment has already been made. All that's left for you to do is believe, which is to receive you believe that this is what God has done. Um, and he becomes your personal savior at that point when you believe. Uh, the word substitution fails to represent all that's been accomplished in the death of Christ. In fact, there's no all-inclusive terms. Um, now, substitution, though, even though it's not a biblical uh, word, we see it all through the scriptures. Um, from the beginning, when Adam and Eve fell in Genesis 3, and God had told them, if you, in the day you eat of it, you will die, uh, they ate of it and found they were naked and tried to cover themselves with fig leaves. And God killed an animal and covered them with the skin of that animal instead, substituting the death of the animal for their death. They should have died. The animal died instead. That's a substitution. And we believe that animal was a lamb, because in Genesis 4, the next chapter, Abel became a shepherd to offer the firstling of the flock um, and the fat portion as a substitute for sin, 
or an offering for sin. And we know the Bible calls him a prophet. And the pro uh, spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus Christ. And the prophets, according to Peter, um, foresaw or inquired into the sufferings of the Christ and the glories to follow. And the seed of the woman had already been promised who would crush Satan's head. And with that, there was this idea of substitution. At the same time God made that promise, he covered them with skins after killing an animal right in front of them. So it was very powerful because that was the first time they saw death. And until he killed that animal, based on his own word, they thought they were going to die. So the death of that animal was substituted for their life. And they were able to continue living and their nakedness was covered by the skin of the animal. Substitution. Um, this is important because a lot of people don't believe in substitutionary atonement. And yet, if you don't believe it, you don't have a way to be saved. <laughs> and it is by believing it that you are saved. So it is that important. Even though the word substitution is not a biblical word, concept is there. And he says, um, by popular usage, the word atonement has been pressed into the service of trying to come up with a word that covers everything the death of Christ implies, and it's not enough. One reason is because uh, atonement is not a New Testament word. Atonement was in the Old Testament, and it meant to cover their sins. Um, he says, this word does not appear in the original text in the New Testament as it was used in the Old Testament only to cover sin. However, the word atonement does indicate the method, or God's method, of dealing with sin before the cross. Um, in the Old Testament, while requiring no more than a symbolic animal sacrifice for the remission of sins uh, and winking at sin, God was acting in perfect righteousness since he was awaiting the one coming, his own lamb, who would no way pass over or cover sin, but who would take it away forever. So what's he saying? He's saying, look, atonement in the Old Testament meant to cover, okay? And there was a sacrifice that was a picture. It was symbolic only. Now they knew this, as we'll see. The, the, the prophets knew that the sufferings were tied up with the promise of the seed. It was he that would suffer and die. Don't listen to the hyper-dispensationalists who tell you that people believed that those animal sacrifices dealt with their sin. No. Those sins were only covered. And God was winking at those sins and tolerating them. And that's uh, in Romans 3.25. Somebody asked me about this the other day, but it says, Whom God has set forth to be a propitiation. Now that's the word, really. Instead of atonement, we have propitiation. Um, through faith in his blood. Okay, God has set forth Christ to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission or tolerance of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. And somebody asked me about that the other day. They said, well, someone is telling me that he only forgave our past sins and if we, we had to deal with our present sins or we're not saved. Well, this actually uh, is not talking about that. This is talking about before the cross, there was a covering provided by man as a substitute that foretold of Christ who would really pay the price. And that covering served as a symbol. It didn't actually take away sins. But God forbeared the sins. He tolerated them and was righteous in doing so because eventually the Lamb would come who would take away the sins of the whole world, past, present, and future. Um, and he says, winking at sin. And that's in Acts where Paul says, uh, he was preaching the gospel and he said, and times of this ignorance, 
God winked at the different sins, but now commands everyone, everywhere, to repent uh, because he's appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he's ordained, where he's given assurance unto all men and that he raised him from the dead. So he's saying he used to wink at mankind's sins and tolerate them. And there was this substitutionary covering you could believe in. But now the man has come, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he is the seed of the woman, seed of Abraham, seed of David, the one to whom all the promises that God ever made to man fall on. He's the heir and he's the representative of the human race. He's the, he is the one who has the ability, first because he's the representative and he, he has all the titles to all the covenants God made with man, all the promises, uh, to represent man in dealings with God. And then as the righteous one who sinned not, he was in a position to lay down his life as a substitute for everybody. And because he did that, he gained the right or purchased the right to judge mankind, to just do whatever he wants with mankind. He owns the human race. He bought it, which we'll see. He can dispose of it. He can save it. He can throw it in the fire, whatever he wants. Okay. But he did that not to condemn mankind, but to save us. And we see that in John where he says, God sent his own son in the world, not that the world would be condemned, but that the world might be saved through him. So he's the rightful judge, but he's the propitiation for all the sins. And he's the substitute. And he is the one that God's committed all judgment to. And so now you either believe in him or reject him and are saved or damned based on that. Uh, let's get back to the, I gotta figure out how to navigate this. Okay. Uh, sorry. Be patient with me. Okay. Um, hmm. how do I get back to my library? Ah. Because I just do that. Um, so now he says uh, he required, so he's talking about how he just required a symbolic uh, animal sacrifice for the remission or the covering or the toleration or the winking at sin. Okay. But he was acting in perfect righteousness in tolerating those sins because the man was coming who would pay the price. Um, and that man is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. The next day, John Jesus sees Jesus coming to him. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Again, all these verses will eventually be in the description for you to look at. Um, okay. In attempting to consider the full value of the death of Christ. Okay, now he's going to talk about the value of the death of Christ. And it gets pretty deep. Several different points. Um, we should distinguish, or we should, we should meditate on, I should say. The death of Christ assures us of the love of God towards the sinner. This is the first thing. The value of his death shows us God's love. Um, John 3.16, we know, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Whoever would believe in him would not perish but have eternal life, right? Then, Romans 5.8 changed my life. But God commends his own love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Now, I used to look at my life and how I felt and my past and how much I had and how much I lost, how much I suffered and how much I gained and compare it to other people and say, this is the evidence of how much God loves me. And it was terrible. <laughs> I didn't believe God loved me. Why? Because I was looking at myself and not at what God points to, 
to commend his love. When he wants to communicate his love to you and fill your heart with the knowledge of his love, he doesn't tell you to look at yourself or your situation. Blessings come and go. Paul said, I've learned to be content. I can abase, I can abound. I can be in prison. I can suffer things that you can't even imagine. And yet I know nothing can separate me from the love of God, which is in Christ. Why could he say that? Because his knowledge was based, knowledge of God's love was rooted in where God had commended his love, which is in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. If you want to know God's love for you, you have to look away from yourself and look to the cross of Christ. The death of Christ is God's communication about his righteousness, um, but his love for you. That's where he's spoken about his love. There is no knowledge of God's love apart from the cross of Christ, because that's where God's communicated it. That's where God dealt with us. And we needed to be dealt with. And there's no, you know, John talks about, or is it James who says, you know, what good does it tell someone to be blessed and be warm and not give him clothes? God accomplished a work to demonstrate his love for us. He gave his only begotten son to death and his son gave himself up for us as a substitution for the penalty for our sins. And that was not because God was angry at us, but because God loved us. So God is not pictured as wrathful and avengeful in the cross of Christ. He is pictured as loving us. If he was just wrathful and vengeful, he would just let us suffer the consequence of our sin. But instead, he gave us his son. And he says, if you want to know my love, you have to look away from yourself and your situation and blessings and not blessing and physical health and not physical health and the ups and downs of this life and how other people are doing and look at the cross of Christ. That's where I've commended my love. And it's while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Not while we were sorry, not while we were trying to persuade God to forgive us, not while we were vowing to do better and trying harder. No, while we were strong in our sin, ungodly, justly condemned, proud of our sins. You know, I, before I was saved, I was proud of my sins. I had a whole lifestyle of sin and I was proud of it. And I wanted people to be proud of it with me. I was a strong sinner, and Christ, God commended his love in that while I was a sinner, Christ died for me. He didn't die for me once I became good. He died for me and commended his love to me and said, I love you while I was a sinner. Something to meditate on. 1 John 3.16, hereby we perceive the love of God because he laid his life down for us. And then John, 1 John 4, 9, And this was manifested, the love of God towards us, because God sent his only begotten Son into the world that we might live through him. How do I know God's love? I have to look at the cross. Nowhere else. That's really important that you look away from yourself and look at the Word of God and what it says about the love of God. And where does he point us to? He points us to the cross. And that, again, is true all the way through the scriptures where is the first occurrence of the word love if you look it up in your bible you'll see that it's in genesis 22 i think 21 where god says to abraham take isaac your only son who you love and sacrifice him to me this was the promised seed and this wasn't his only son, by the way, because Ishmael was his son too. But God didn't recognize Ishmael, and this wording is very specific. Because doesn't it sound like God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son? He said, take your son whom you love and make him an offering. And so Isaac gathered, uh, Abraham Isaac gathered Isaac, who, by the way, was around 30, maybe 33, who followed him obediently uh, for a three-day journey. And he's carrying the wood and the fire. And he said, Father, we have. He said, Father, 
And he said, here I am, son. Really interesting exchange. He says, we have the wood and we have the fire, but where's the offering? Where's the burnt offering? He knew it was an offering for sin. He knew it was an offering for God. They were going to offer. And Abraham said, God will provide himself an offering. <laughs> so Abraham pointed to substitution. Okay. And then we know that when Abraham was ready to raise the knife to kill Isaac, who represented all the promises of God, and Hebrews 11 says he believed that Isaac would have to be raised from the dead because God could not lie who promised him all these things. So he believed in, he, he believed in resurrection. Interesting. And he knew Isaac was either a forerunner, either the Christ or the forerunner of the Christ, the seed that was promised, the seed of Abraham. He's sacrificing him. And at the last minute, the angel, the word of the Lord, appears to him and says, don't do it. <laughs> and he looks up and there's a ram caught in a thicket by its head. Now the ram is the substitute. And that ram was substituted for Isaac. Uh, now, the ram caught in the thicket by its horns really reminds me, of course, of the crown of thorns on Jesus' head. His head was caught in a thicket. A thicket is a thorn bush. And he is the Lamb of God who took away the sins of the world. This is the first instance of the word love in the Bible in this beautiful picture of the Father offering his Son as a substitute. And when God put the ram in its place, in the place of Isaac, Abraham named the mount Jehovah Jireh, which means God will provide, and said, in the mount of the Lord it shall be seen, which again is a prophetic utterance. And 2,000 years later, on that same mountain, Moriah, God offered his son and commended his love and that he offered his only begotten son as a substitute for our sins. And Abraham knew that, okay? The spirit of prophecy. Abraham was a prophet. Uh, God told uh, Pharaoh that Abraham was a prophet, which means, again, he had the testimony. He inquired concerning the sufferings of the Christ and the glories to follow. The seed of Abraham would eventually, the descendant of Isaac, is Christ, would be the substitute for the sins and the propitiation. And that is the demonstration of God's love. And the first use of a word in the Bible governs its definition throughout the Bible, typically. So this is how God defined love. From the very beginning of Genesis, when you talk about love, its first use is in this story that perfectly illustrates the offering of Christ for our sins. How do I know God loves me? Okay, it is not look at myself and my feelings. Look how warm my heart feels. How many dreams did I get? Did I get a gift? Is he using me? No, it is. While I was a sinner, Christ died for me. That's how God commends his love. That's how he wants us to think of it. And it's as you think about things the way God wants you to think about them based on his definitions that the spirit comes in to bear witness and fill your heart with the taste of those things you're meditating on. It's so important to think about things why, the way God does. And that's why you want to take these verses and write them down in a notebook and memorize them and meditate on them. Okay. Now this is a fairly academic study, but I'm trying to fill it in a little with some heart stuff, you know. Um, okay, so then he says, now the death of Christ assures us that the love of God towards the sinner. Remember, we're talking about the value of Christ's death. What's its first point? It manifests God, it demonstrates God's love towards us. And then he says, 
uh, naturally a reflex influence or moral appear, appeal through this truth upon the life of everyone who receives it. Okay, here's two verses. Well, let's just look at this one. 2 Corinthians 5.15 And he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live to themselves, but he which died for them and rose again. Doesn't that sound like a demand? Well, it's not. Okay, it is a appeal. And the New Testament, when you get to the epistles, which are the writings to the churches, what you have are not so many commandments, but as appeals. They appeal to you based on something that's already true, based on God's love for you, based on the fact that Christ died for us, we live unto him. And this is something, an appeal, it's, it's the appeal to a new nature. This is not something that is told to believers. I, I'm sorry, unbelievers. Unbelievers have nothing in them that corresponds to something like this. You tell, an un, a lordshipper tells an unbeliever, Christ died for you and therefore you owe him your life and you better give it to him. And the unbeliever being an entity of God, entity of enemy of God, hostile towards God, unable to be subject to God, says, I can't do that, nor will I. <laughs> okay? But a believer has been regenerated and has Christ living in him and has a new nature. And he doesn't need an outward command to give himself to God. He needs an appeal that's based on something God has done for him. This is the way it works. God appeals to us based on what he has done. He has given Christ for us and it's in manifesting his love for us in Christ to our hearts and bringing us into the knowledge of that love that there's an appeal that we would live unto him. And that appeal is not outward like, please give yourself to Jesus because you owe him. No, it's a response from your new nature that happens automatically. The appeals that are based on Christ's work come out of his own, that are fulfilled by his own life in us. This is really deep and I don't have time to really develop it here. But I used to read that. Uh, 2 Corinthians you know, he died for all that they who live should not live to themselves, but to him that rose again after he died for them. Yeah, you're right. I should give myself to Jesus. And of course, I would find that I couldn't because now I'm in the flesh. And when I'm in the flesh, the law of sin says, no, I ain't living to Jesus. Are you kidding me? <laughs> but when I'm in the spirit, I'm not looking at the command to give myself to Jesus. I'm giving I'm looking at what is this appeal based on? He died for all. He died for me. He died for me. But unto him who died for them and rose again, and he's risen. And where is he risen? He's in me. And so my life is not me living, it's Christ living. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And it is actually my nature, my new nature, is to live to him. See, the appeal is based on something, that a reality that he established. And this is a good way for you to understand how to read the Bible and get and find the source of life. Because we are not under the letter where we're looking for commandments and instructions of what to do. We are looking for what did God accomplish in Christ that is the basis of the appeal. And when we look at that and believe in it, the response in us is automatic. You don't have to tell me to live to Christ and love him. You just need to show me how God loved me by giving me Christ who died for me and commended his love in dying for me while I was yet a sinner. And my heart is full of thanksgiving. And that thanksgiving is my response unto him, which is living unto him. It, it is, and it's his life in me. That's something to meditate on because I can't explain it better right now. Uh, First Peter 2 21 through 24, for even hereunto were you called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow in his footsteps. Uh, he suffered for us. Let's look at the verse. Um, who did no sin, neither was God found in his mouth. Right. He was reviled, he reviled not in return. 
here is it. Here it is. Who his own self bore our sins in his own body on the tree. Now we do revile in return, but he didn't. He was righteous. He knew no sin. And then he bore our sin. So first he executed perfectly and fulfilled the righteousness we never could because he is righteous. And then he bore our sins in his body on the tree that we being dead to sins should live to righteousness. <laughs> By whose stripes you are healed. For you are as all sheep going astray, but now have returned to the shepherd and bishop of your souls. He is here to shepherd your soul and be the bishop of your soul. And he heals you by shepherding your soul back to him. Because if you, if it was on you, you would complain and yell and say, no, I, I don't need to die. I'm, I'm good. You know, you would rebel against such a thing. You would never give yourself an obedience to the father the way he did, but he did it. If you want to say his righteousness, that's his righteousness, his act of obedience to the father by surrendering himself entirely for our sins, come on. And then he bore our sins in his own body on the tree. That is visceral, it's physical, it hurt, it's real, it's intimate. Okay, it's real. Meditate on that. He bore, this is the basis of the appeal. He bore our sins in his own body on the tree. And by his stripes, he bore the beating to bring us back to God. Do you think that that was effective? Well, as you meditate on it, you will feel, find yourself full of the reality of it. As you start to meditate on the fact that he, by, my, by his stripes, I was healed. He bore my own sins in his own body on the tree and was bruised for me and was hurt for me and was wounded for me and died for me and gave himself for me. That fills your heart and heals your soul. What's the response? To be shepherded back to him. See, we would all go our own way, but God laid on him the iniquity of us all. This comes from Isaiah 53. By his stripes we are healed. He's the shepherd and the bishop of our soul. He's the one taking care of it, but how does he do it? By revealing to us the basis of his appeal. He, yes, he appeals to us to give ourselves to him and live to him, but how does he, what is the basis of that appeal? And it's as we meditate on the basis of the appeal that we find our heart filled with his life as the power to be what the appeal says. The appeal makes a request, but that request is not on us or our flesh. The appeal is always based on something God has done in Christ. And this is how I look at the Bible now. When I read any kind of command, especially in the New Testament epistles, you will find that it is always based on something that God has already done and provided as a substitute. God provided Christ as our substitute, as an offering for our sins, and it's on that basis that he becomes our substitute in being our life to fulfill the righteousness required in the appeal. He's in us as our life. And the way this thing works is we find the basis of the appeal, which is God's work in Christ, and we meditate on it until we're full of the appreciation for it. And then we just are as he is in the world. So are we in this world. This is the way faith works. We look away, not, we look to, not to ourselves. We look to what God has accomplished in Christ as the basis for everything that God describes that he wants from us. And we don't try to fulfill it ourselves. We admire how Christ fulfilled it. See, it's when the demand comes to you, you realize you're short. Well, that just increases your appreciation of how marvelous Jesus is. He gave himself. He, here he's talking about, you know, here's an example. Because Christ suffered for us, leaving us an example, that you should follow his steps. Who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. Who, when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he entreated not. He threatened not, but committed to himself, to him that judges righteously. 
who his own self bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we being dead to sins should live to righteousness, by whose stripes you are healed. Just meditate on that. And you're full of an appreciation. And the thing is, is this is in context is talking about <laughs> working for a boss who's not fair. And you're being, you know, <laughs> persecuted for righteousness sake in the middle of, I think, a job situation. Servants, be subject to your masters with all fear, even the ones that are mean. Not only to the gentle, but also to the mean ones. You can't do that. I've tried. I remember I've worked a job that was like that. And I said, I'm going to be a good Christian and I'm going to suffer and I'm going to be in silence. I couldn't do it. I eventually had to complain because it's not fair. And then I would repent and try to, you know, it didn't matter. I was a sinner. I was discovered to be a sinner in that situation. But then the appeal for me to work for that boss that way was not supposed to be based on my own strength. I was supposed to get the power by meditating on what he presents as the basis of his appeal. What is that? For, uh, he talks about being buffeted for your soul. He's talking about, he's making all these appeals, right? For there and to where you're called because Christ suffered for us, leaving us an example. Here's the basis of the appeal. Who did no sin, neither was God found in his mouth. Who, when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not. Opposite of me at work. And committed himself to him that judges righteously, which is the father, not as not Pontius Pilate. He said, you have no authority unless God gave it to you. Who his own self bore our sins in his body on the tree. That we, being dead to sins, should live to righteousness by whose stripes you are healed. What is the healing? Well, I'm not going to be able to live that out in front of a boss. What's the healing? To come to Jesus and let him hit, live his life in me. The focus gets off of me and back onto the basis. So there's an appeal, which causes me to fall short. I go, oh, I can't do that. And then I start to appreciate how Christ did. Just like, man, I'm never gonna be that person, but Jesus is, wow. And that's it. The, you are just meditating on what Christ did to manifest his love. But from that flows an appreciation. And then as you're not looking at yourself anymore, you'll actually find that you're doing better in that situation. It's amazing how it works. This whole thing works by appreciating Christ. And then his life flows in you unconsciously while you're appreciating him. There's a weight of glory being wrought into you while you look. Not to those things which are seen, but to the things which are unseen. While you look away to Jesus, he bears the burden. And you'll find out you did better than you thought, but it won't be about what you did. And that's something I can't really explain here. This is way beyond the scope of what we're talking about. But I wanted to, uh, I felt inspired to go there. That there is an appeal, okay, for righteousness. But it's always based on the work of God in Christ. And that's why it's so important to know these verses. Uh, and what we're talking about here is the fact that the death of Christ commends the love of God towards us. So yes, we're talking about practical situations at work and stuff. How, and how, what is the basis of the appeal? But the root here is God wants us to look away from ourselves as the basis of the appeal to live unto Christ and realize God's love in Christ. Nothing can separate me from the love of God which is in Christ. And the more I realize that, the more I live unto him not by effort, not by knowing I should, you know, but because my heart is full of thanks and appreciation towards him. Oh, there's so much. Okay, so I'm going to have to stop here and uh, do part two of this message tomorrow. Uh, and we'll see what you guys think. Uh, I may not get the verses in there tonight, but look them up, please. Write them down while I'm talking. Um, I will get them in there in the description, if not tonight, tomorrow, okay? Have a good evening.